Hey everyone, after more than 15 years in the business, I finally got a book published. If you want to do me the biggest favor in the whole world, please head over to MikeyOp.com and buy a copy. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P.com and the book is named Ardor and it's about psychics and the history and future of the universe. I wrote it and I think you'll love it. Hey everybody, this is Mike Oppenheim and you are listening to Coffin Talk, interviews with the living and this is a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life and I have one of my oldest, best, 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 best friends in the whole world, that's five or six best in case you're keeping track. Uh, He's calling from Michigan where he recently moved but I originally met him in high school and he's actually from Chicago slash France, we'll probably get into some of that. But his name is Frank Ray Herm. He's an amazing friend, and I have alluded to him a million times on different podcasts, but uh, he and I played in a band together for two straight years in Ithaca, New York, and uh, I am just so ecstatic to have him on the line. So I'm not even going to talk about what he does for a living or his personal life. I'm just going to let the conversation unfold. So Frank, how's it going? It's going well. How are you doing? Good to talk to you. Yeah, no, it's awesome. It's great to talk to you. And uh, we had like a nice little hockey convo on text yesterday, and that was that totally primed me for a, co- a conversation that will have no hockey in it, unfortunately. <laughs> so yeah, um, you're currently in Michigan, but the standard questions we ask people is always, how old are you? Where did you grow up? And what generation, if any, do you consider yourself a member of? Uh, I am 41, I think, but sometimes it's hard to keep track. Uh, <laughs> I. I don't know. Some people tell me I'm a millennial. Some people tell me I'm a Gen Xer. I don't really know or particularly put much stock in those in those labels. I uh, I would say if I had to pick one, it would definitely be the the Gen X generation. Cool. I think I'm steady Eddie with you. And then uh, where did you grow up? Because I know you're kind of you have a couple origin stories. How do you tell it? Yeah, I mean, I say I grew up in Chicago, in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, so I was born in Paris or just outside of Paris, and I lived in France until I was uh, six years old. And then at the age of six, my family relocated to the Chicago area, and I grew up in, in Chicago. And then at the age of 16, uh, I moved to – or my family moved to California. I was not happy about it at the time. Well, I'm happy because that's how I met you. Um, And it never occurred to me in all of our millions of talks to ask you this, but what age do you remember, if any, that you lost your accent at? I I don't. Yeah, I I am not. I don't remember that. I'm not sure I had one for very long at all. Okay. I remember showing up in the United States on the first day of school and not speaking hardly any English at all. Really, I just knew, like, where's the bathroom? And that's that's about it. I remember that first day of school very vividly. It's it's very much seared into my brain. Uh, but after that, I don't even remember learning English. Like, it's just, I think, you know, as a kid that age, you learn languages so fast. So I don't even remember learning English at all. I don't remember having an accent or, or losing it. It was really just I remember that first day of school. And then the next thing I knew, I was fluent English and, in fact, had a much harder time remembering uh, French and speaking French. And, you know, it kind of flipped very, very quickly. That's cool. And that's also fascinating to me for a million reasons. Um, also, I do remember going to France with you when we were like both 18, maybe 19. I don't remember which. And uh, you obviously were able to speak to me, at least in front of me, fluent enough French that some people didn't even notice you were not from the country. Others did, though, I remember. And I remember that being like super shocking to me that like watching that dynamic without understanding what either of you were saying to each other. But I could see like I don't want to I don't know if friction is the right word, but I could just see that like something else was going on. And I always thought that was interesting. Cause I remember you got mad one time. Cause you're like, she said I wasn't like speaking it right or something. I can't remember. I don't know if that rings a bell. But. Yeah. No, first of all, that was a really fun trip. Uh, <laughs> that was awesome. But yeah, language is a really, really interesting thing. Uh, so what happens when I go back to France is it takes me a few days to kind of get adjusted, but after a few days, it comes back to me. There's something about the fact that it was my first language that 
um, makes it so it's pretty deeply ingrained. So even if I though, even though if I tried to start speaking right now, it would be difficult. When I go back to France after a few days, uh, it starts coming back to me really quickly. And if I spend a few weeks there, I start thinking in French, which wow. like is sh like shocking. And that's when I need to go home because like it, <laughs> it kind of messes with, kind of messes with my mind when when you start like thinking in another language. That's cool. And you're married. You have a beautiful wife and three children, which just blows my mind in the best ways possible. Because you know we were like young bandmates in Ithaca, New York, 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> and have you taken any or all of them to France? Uh, I have taken all but the youngest one to France. Cool. He hasn't been to France yet. She. She's three. It's had a. I assume you've experienced this, but <laughs> anyone who's traveled with a toddler will know what I'm talking about, or traveled with a baby for that matter. It's very, very difficult. Yeah. So we we went to France when my two older kids were, I think, three and four, around that age. We went because my grandfather's health was starting to decline. It was going to maybe be the last chance to kind of see him. Uh, so we took the whole family and went went for for a few weeks. Uh, and it was it was difficult traveling with those really young kids. Uh, right now, my youngest is three, so we'll probably wait a couple years before we we take her there. But certainly, at some point, we'll we'll take her. Cool. And I was kind of asking that just to lead up to, um, did your kids, like, did it blow their mind to see you speak like another language in the actual country where other people are speaking it? I think, I mean, the main reaction I got was like, well, you know, why don't you speak French at home? And, <laughs> and why don't you teach me how to speak French? And, what, you know, like that kind of stuff, which yeah. uh, no matter the age is often the reaction I get. Cause I, when I'm, not in France. I don't speak a lot of French. Yeah, there's, okay. I just don't. I don't have much of a desire to or or need to. Uh, so it's really you know they don't see it unless I go to France. Or sometimes they'll see it like when I'm on the phone with like a relative or something like that. Wow, that's so fascinating. I think that's I've exhausted all the questions about that because I mean I've talked to you a million times about a lot of this. Um, I wanted to prime our audience for like one of the reasons I consider you my best 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 friend. Um, is that you introduced me to self-awareness of philosophy. So I may or may not have been a philosophical person my whole life. I have no idea. I just know that we met when we were, you said 16, but I think we were 15, but I don't know, maybe I'm younger than you. Um, but it was our sophomore year in high school. And I remember going to your house yeah. and you had like printed pages of inspirational quotes around your room, which at the time was like <laughs> both the nerdiest and lamest thing I'd ever seen, but it was also oddly inspiring. And I remember like, being like, oh, this guy's confident in his intelligence and like awareness and things and I'm not. And I remember like glomming onto that. And that, that was a huge um, feature of attraction for you to me as like becoming your friend was like, there was a maturity to you and there still always has been. Oof. It was definitely lame and nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back on that, I'm like, oh man. I mean, it stems from just, I absolutely love literature that's why i became an english teacher mm -hmm. um i i love literature um and so all the quotes that were up on my walls were just like passages from some of my favorite books yeah and uh to this day i i don't spend as much time as i'd like to right now mainly because i have three young kids uh reading but i'll i'll get back to it and i'm not an english teacher anymore so i don't get to do it as part of my job but that is still with me like anytime i have a vacation like i pick up a novel like i, I love reading novels i'm excited to read your novel yeah thank you that was a great plug <laughs> i ordered it i'll be reading it soon cool thank you i appreciate that and actually um so I, I don't think I'm going to wait any further to get into the actual meaty question of the podcast, which is what do you think happens when you die? So I'd love for you to answer that to whatever extent you feel comfortable. And then I'm going to tie that into things we were just discussing. Yeah, well, I mean, it, as someone who sort of likes philosophy, I'll, it'll be a perhaps a disappointing answer because <laughs> my answer is I don't know. And um, I've, I try to 
live my life in a way where if I don't know something, then I acknowledge that I don't know and I don't try to invent stories or beliefs or anything uh, to fill that gap. Uh, I have no idea. I really don't have a clue what happens other than my body will decompose and that's about the extent. So that's really the best way I can answer that question. It's kind of why I felt when you first asked me to be on this podcast, like, I'm not sure I'm like uh, the right person for this podcast because I'm not going to give you like some, you know, but big belief for explanation. It's just, I have no idea. Well, actually, it's funny because the conceptualization for the podcast is very different from how I present it now. But when Alana and I kind of like invented it, we were just talking back and forth about it. And we thought what we would do is ask people at the very beginning that question and then trace it backwards through their life to see how their morality was or was not affected by it. And it still is how I'm operating the podcast. I just don't really express that at the beginning, nor do I ask the question at the beginning anymore. Instead, I kind of trace people's life because I found that that was actually more interesting and then to see how it applies to it. So with all that said, um, a lot of people who don't know about death seem to be actually sort of relaxed and calm, but there are some who like it inspires them to be anxious or fearful and all that. How would you describe the effect of that philosophy on yourself? Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P.com. Thanks. Well... I have tried, it's, you know, a constant struggle, though I've certainly gotten better as I've gotten older, to be comfortable with uncertainty. Uh, I, I have found that when I was younger, uncertainty drove me crazy. Uh, I think I'm not the only one. I think, generally speaking, human beings don't like uncertainty. Uh, and so... I have tried to kind of get more comfortable with it. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, yet alone what's going to happen after I die. And I, for a long time, was thinking like, oh, if I could just get a good enough job or have a good enough relationship or whatever it is, I would then be more like secure or certain, you know, if I get a good enough job, then I know I'll be able to put food on the table tomorrow, or I know my you know, partner won't leave me tomorrow or whatever. But, but like, it's a fool's errand, right? Like that's never going to happen. So instead I kind of took the other approach, which is like, well, you have to be comfortable with uncertainty. And so I, it helps a lot, honestly, because I don't think there's any way to get rid of uncertainty, at least not like in an honest way, right? Sort of like kind of fooling yourself. And so the only way I've been able to kind of get calmer um, as I've gotten older is to like accept and embrace and be comfortable with uncertainty. I'm kind of in the same boat, except the path I took to the uncertainty was like the opposite. I think I was pretty confident when I was younger that there was an answer and I would find it. I didn't have confidence that I knew it. And now uh, at 41, I'm like, nah, it's probably not going to happen. I've interviewed enough people and too many confident people have told me too many awesome, inspiring versions. And they all either contradict each other or they lead to one of two things. One is whatever I think happens is what I'm going to experience because I'm just dominating what I see through my pathological mind that would be like one explanation for consciousness. And then the other one is no one's right or wrong and it's going to blow my effing mind versus, you know, nothing and all that. Well, and it would never end, right? It's like, it's a, it's like a recursive type of thing. It's infinite. So let's even say you were able to answer the question, what happens after you die? Well, then what happens after that? <laughs> you know, it's like, it never, it never ends because yeah. I, whatever, if anything happens after you die, I can, only imagine it would just be another phase, uh, you know, like phase one to phase two, and then what's phase three or, you know, whatever number it is. So it it, it gets to, you know, even if you start, like, I, I know it's childish, but, you know, they're like, you know, they're like, is there, like, you know, 
is there a God? Like, did God create you? Okay, well, fine. Let's say you answer that question and say, okay, God created you. Well, then who created God? And then who, you know, it's just like it goes on and on. Like, it never, it never ends. And it's kind of like, you know, it's it's that kind of reasoning can seem childish, but at the same time, it I don't know, it's pretty logical or it seems logical to me. And so you just end up with, you know, there's a limit to how much you'll know and understand and you just kind of have to accept it at, at some point. Yeah. And I think if I had to guess too, it would probably be an, an intuitive experience would be the answer to all these questions, not a logical or third dimensional like explanation. Like there's no word to point to something that's, and by the way, what I call that God question, that endless God question is the Rus Russian nesting doll dilemma, which is like, mm -hmm. you know, there's like another doll inside the doll. And like, at some point, you know, how does it work? And I, I just, I do, I think about that obsessively until my mind hurts. And then I usually go to sleep. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so like morality, the reason I, I wanted you on the podcast too, is that you were one of the more moral people I ever met. And I'm going to tell a weird story that will explain this to people. And it's my favorite story about you. Um, when we were kids, I, I was pudgy, if not fat, depending on how people want me to use that word, because fat shaming is not okay. But as a formerly fat person, I, I don't mind calling myself fat. And I would make a lot of fun of you because you were like a new kid. And one day, because you were like this tough hockey player, you pulled my shirt over my head, <laughs> and like pushed me in the back of class and totally humiliated me. But again, like, in my opinion, it was totally deserved. I'd been like, pushing you, pushing you, pushing you. And I remember like, going home and thinking about it and instead of like hating you and becoming enemies with you i respected you for it because like it all made sense to me and then as we became friends i started to notice that that was like a part of your overall morality which is like uh i don't want to call it stoicism and it also may have changed a lot but you, you seem to me to be a quite morally driven person do you agree with that statement uh i certainly thought like if you had asked me in high school, I would yeah. have said yes. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, when I look back on my high school stuff, I even wrote a song about this <laughs> called Miramani in, in our band. Oh, I'll totally close the show with that, actually. Uh, and I used to think I used to think I was right. Right? Like I used to think I was right. I used to is is really, you know, the the chorus of that song. <laughs> um and yeah, I in high school, I, I, I would have told you, yeah, like I'm a moral person. Uh, but as I've gotten older, I I mean, I still have. And, and my wife would tell you, I still certainly have that in me. I think I'm right. About, yeah. <laughs> but I, I really try to, you know, know that I, I don't know if I'm right uh, I try to be a moral person, but I screw up all the time and I don't even know what is right or wrong, you know, whereas before I used to think, oh yeah, it's very obvious what the right thing is to do. Uh, and I was very like sure of, you know, my own opinion and now not so much, right? Like any thought I have, like, oh, well, this might be the right thing to do, but I'm not sure. It's not really clear. Um, you know, kind of goes back to the un uncertainty thing. It's, um, it, so it's hard for me to say now, like, yes, I believe I'm a moral person because it's not crystal clear to me anymore, like what is right and what is wrong. I mean, obviously, there are certain things that are you know wrong <laughs> uh but at least in my mind but it's you know on, on the kind of day-to-day -day life it's not it's not clear you know like i remember in high school for a while i was in a kick that i was like you know honesty honesty is is a virtue and you got to be honest and i i i i took it to I guess an extreme probably for a while. So some people thought I was a jerk and rightfully so, because, you know, you, like I would say things that were not nice or polite to say. They, they may have been true, but they weren't like very nice. And so is that right? Like, is it, are you doing the right thing? If you say something that 
is true. So you would think telling the truth is, is the right thing to do, but is it like, not really, not all the time, maybe, you know, again, there's, there's like, you're not sure. So uh, that's the best way I can answer that question. I really, I, you know, and I, I, I try to, to not harm other people. Uh, that's like the extent of my morality, but even that, you know, like I'm, I'm, I don't kid myself. Like when it comes to like my own survival, I would absolutely harm someone else if it, if I had to, uh, to survive. Absolutely. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I was going to mention this a lot earlier, but the reason I'd asked you about your career and stuff is I was hoping you would get into the fact that you were a high school teacher because, um, first of all, I have tremendous respect for that position. And second of all, I think it really informs an adult differently than the rest of the adult culture. Um, and so you've left it, but it doesn't mean you still don't have like a pretty good pulse on it, especially since you still work in education, which we may or may not get into later. But, um, how was it when you were teaching and you felt that like, cause I taught too, you totally have a power to influence your students' morality, at least temporarily. And, uh, actually the influence of a teacher is quite profound according to a lot of research studies. Um, how did you feel about that power? Did you ever notice it? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I tried, I tried to not give my opinion too much when I was a teacher, right? Like, especially as an English teacher where you, you bring up, you know, you, you discuss a lot of controversial issues, you know, part of it was, you know, I had to, you have to be careful as a teacher mm -hmm. more these days than ever, but yeah. even when I was a teacher, especially when you're, you're teaching kids, right? You say the wrong thing, you can lose your job. So I was always pretty careful about what, what I said, but as you know from you know we were we were on a you know debate or public speaking team together in high school i'm pretty good about uh you know i'm pretty good in terms of like being able to argue both sides whichever one my personal belief is so as a teacher i would always try to uh, sort of argue with the students no matter what they said so i would argue uh, both sides and nice. that's kind of how I dealt with it. My goal was to get them to be thinkers, you know, critical thinkers, not and not influence them with my own personal opinion. Uh, you know, to s some extent, I'm sure that my personal opinions for the students who were paying attention, they could probably figure it out. It's, you know, impossible to completely hide it, but I, I tried very much to uh, you know, really just kind of play devil's advocate constantly with anything they would say to get them to defend what they were, you know, whatever they were arguing. So that's, you know, and that's really like to this day, like I, I believe that's why, you know, I was a teacher for almost 10 years and then I worked in ed tech for the rest of my career, like about 10 years now. Um, and now I, I'm, uh, you know, an AI developer uh, focusing specifically on, you know, natural language processing and, you know, but the whole time, even, you know, I, I wouldn't want to do, you know, machine learning for like an insurance company or something <laughs> like that, right? Like I, I, I do it because I think it's helping students. I just believe so strongly in the importance and benefit of education and specifically public education, but really any kind of education. So the idea of spending my time trying to get, you know, young adults to think and, and think critically and become more self-aware about their thinking and their opinions, you know, just like, it's like I've become more self-aware compared to how I was in, in high school, you know, just be more thoughtful. I just think it's, it's so important. Um, and although I absolutely love what I do now, um, I miss teaching. And if I could make a, if I could make a better living as a teacher, I would, I would go back and be a teacher in a heartbeat. I loved it. I, I miss it. Actually, I do want to push you on a hot topic. People are constantly saying like, this generation's going to ruin everything. These kids are blah, blah, blah. These kids are blah, blah, blah. I don't care 
one way or the other when I hear that stuff. But I'm very curious what you think when you hear people say that. Oh yeah, it's 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 silly. <laughs> I mean, you know, like people are are people. I, I find that people are much more similar than they are different. It's why, like, I get I get frustrated sometimes with the identity politics. Not that I want to get you in the politics, but just like the, you know, yeah, you have a different hair color, skin color, or you know, you came maybe from a different country speak a different language come from a different generation but we're we're so much more similar than we are different in my in my mind and i just wish we would like spend a little more time focusing on our like common humanity than our uh like superficial differences that sounds really cheesy when i say it but uh i think you you know what i mean <laughs> I totally know what you mean. And actually, uh, I wasn't prepared to ask this question because I didn't think it would come up. But now that it did, I'm actually like licking my chops to ask you. Uh, never in the history of humanity has there been a more uh, broad and aimless conversation about artificial intelligence and machine learning than right now. It is, um, as we record, April 13th, 2023. Every single outlet of media is basically talking about this from comedians to serious people like it doesn't matter it's just like the most hot topic ever for those of you listening like five years from now all this chat gbt stuff just really hit mainstream and people are freaking out about it so as a morality expert or not expert and you know with all these things i've introduced you as and picked your brain about how does all that tie into machine learning and ai are you fearful are you pro do you think we should have uh, checks and balances? Are politicians the types of people who care and would be educated enough? I have so many questions to ask you. Just go off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I am not fearful right now. I think there's a, and I'll say yet, right? I am not fearful yet. I think there's a, there's a lot of hype right now. And certainly what, you know, what, what open AI has released in chat GPT over the last few months here is it's cool. It's impressive, but from a technical perspective, those of us who, who work in AI know that it's really like, the, there's not much new there. They're just scaling up what we've already been done. I mean, chat GPT is nothing but next word prediction that your phone has been doing for years, except instead of a word, it, it, it'll do you know, thousands of words, but that's really what it is. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of hype right now around chat GPT and AI. It's, and it's, you know, there's some, again, it, it's, it's impressive. It's impressive. I don't want to like say it's not impressive. It's, it's cool. It's actually more capable than I thought it would be given the current approach. Um, but it's still like, you know, the people worried about, AI like taking over the world like we're not there yet. I mean the current approach to AI is very much like a brute force approach. Uh and to me doesn't in any way mirror like the way a child learns, right? So um a child doesn't need a billion examples to learn something whereas our current AI models do. Um you know, we want like if we're truly like I don't whether we want to or not is a different question. But if we're trying to actually truly develop, you know, general artificial intelligence, I feel like we're still pretty darn far off from that. You know, Chat GPT has memorized the internet, but that's not understanding. You know, what's I guess it, it becomes a question of like what's the difference between memorizing and understanding, especially when you can memorize you know, there's almost no, there's no limit pretty much to what you can memorize if you're a computer. So, but in terms of like, it doesn't, chat GPT has no agency. If you play around with it, I mean, it's cool. But then if you think about it, like it will never ask you a question oh. unless you tell it to. Wow. Unless you explicitly tell it to. That's profound. And I mean, so like that to me makes it, like it can't be intelligent and uh, something that's intelligent would ask you questions, would ask you follow-up questions right now. If you ask it something 
it's going to spit back some an- answer, the, you know, the best answer it thinks, but it, it's never going to think, oh, I don't understand. Let me ask some follow-up questions to get more information. It doesn't do that unless you explicitly tell it to. And, and then in that case, it's just following your script. Like it doesn't have any agency. It doesn't, you know, um, so it, it's, it, to me, we're still very, very far from something that's, you know, truly intelligent, even though what it's doing is really cool and is certainly useful. Um, it's, it, to me, I, I could be proven wrong. You know, I just want to say that again. Like I, 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 it's already doing more with this approach, with this kind of brute force neural network approach than I, than I thought it could. Um, but I, I don't see us getting to true general, you know, general artificial intelligence using current methods, you know, maybe you'll play this back in a few years and I'll just have to eat my words, but that's not what I'm seeing right now. I'm seeing something more of a, like a, a a parlor trick than I am of like true artificial intelligence. And, you know, the, the AI community is divided on it. There are definitely many others who feel like I do. Uh, And then there are others who, who disagree, you know, it's not crystal clear, but, but it's, it's fun to be in this field because it has the working in AI has become extremely philosophical about, you know, like what does it mean to be intelligent? What does it mean to understand? Does memorizing the internet make you intelligent? I don't think so. Like even just look at the way Chad GPT does math. Okay. Chad GPT can do basic math, but once the numbers get too high, it, it fails. It gives wrong answers. So it can do math because there's enough math on the internet that it has memorized and so can spit back out some answers. But if you truly understand addition, bigger numbers won't make a difference, really. It might just take you longer, but it, it, it won't make a difference. So like as far as I can tell, it's, it's memorized math facts, but it doesn't really understand math. And as they give it more and more data, it's able to do more and more math. But it's still just memorizing more and not really understanding it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, today's AI is really based on, like, brute force computing power. Like, it's it, – in terms of, like, the, the technology, it's not doing anything that we haven't been doing for years. In fact, neural networks go back to the – I think the 60s or 70s. Um, and this is just a, a neural network, but bigger. You know, so it's really just brute force computing power. So I'm of the mind that if we're truly going to get to artificial intelligence, it's not going to be using this approach. Again, I could be completely wrong, but that's kind of what I'm leaning towards right now, if that makes sense. I absolutely loved all of that, and I, I mostly agree with you. Um, the other thing I would just add to this conversation that I, I say in person to people is because we're human and we have like skepticism and we think everything would act like humans, we think that robots with their own autonomous intelligence would act like us, but I see no reason to believe that. I don't see animals attacking humans for random reasons or getting angry and attacking people to kill them. Like A lot of the human problems seem to be very distinctly human. So I don't see why robots wouldn't be like peaceful and nice and kind because they actually have like a higher reasoning function than we do and they don't have emotions that get in the way. So a lot of, you know, like actually France is a famous country because they really came up with the idea of like passionate crimes. And that's a that's had a huge influence on the Western culture as a whole. And I agree with it. I think some people who plot a crime and kill someone is very different from someone who gets extremely agitated and out of their mind and i do think we should punish differently yeah that's interesting yeah i mean if we ever do get to artificial intelligence um yeah i i don't anticipate it'll be you know like humans i'm sure it'll be different but you know like i was saying i'm not i'm not sure we're we're there you know what we're doing right now is essentially like just kind of probabilistic um outputs based on you know like billions of parameters and you know 
as much data as we can throw at it, like the entire internet's worth of, of data. Um, but it doesn't, I'm not sure I would call that intelligence. I know we call it artificial yeah. intelligence, but I'm not sure I would call it intelligence. So, you know, the, it, it's, some people, you know, worry about, I mean, there's definitely real concerns, right? Like certainly like what chat GPT can do will threaten some people's jobs in the next few years. No, no question. Yeah. Right. But so, so did the car, right? So did robots um, in a factory and, and, and society needs to be mindful of you know, the disruptive nature of this technology, like lots of technologies, and ideally sort of try to guide society through the changes in a way that hurts, uh, you know, fewer people. Because it's definitely going to be a disrupting technology, but that's very different than, you know, robots are going to take over the world kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm totally with you, and I like that you keep saying machine learning because I think we just love to use only one phrase in this culture and to have no nuance in any intelligent conversation. Well, in any conversation, I think the intelligent conversations do have nuance, but no one seems to be clicking on that or uh, tuning in for that. So good luck, larger culture as a whole that I sound quite bitter against, but I'm really not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do hope we get back to like nuance matters and like your opinions should have nuance and it's okay to not have a broad brush paint stroke. Um, but enough pontificating by me. We are closing in on the end of the interview. And I always give my guests a chance to just kind of like have the floor and give what I hope would be a peaceful message to all the people listening. So what would you like to say to the people who listen to the show? Yeah, I mean, I have to go back to what I said earlier, you know, get, get comfortable with uncertainty. You, you, you don't know there's a lot that you don't know. You're not going to know what happens tomorrow and constantly attempting to, um, you know, be certain about what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, I don't think, I, I think it leads to anxiety. So yeah, get comfortable with uncertainty. And, and if you don't know, just say it and be comfortable with it. I, I, so many times I hear people when they don't know something, they, instead of saying they don't know, they, they throw out some, some belief or theory or, or something like that. Um, whereas you could just say, you don't know. And then you can think about it and you can talk about it. And I love doing that, you know, like we're doing now, like I've done with you for many, many hours over many, many years. Uh, it's fun to, to think about it and and useful, but at the end of the day, if if you don't know, accept it and be be comfortable with it and and admit it. That's so awesome, Frank, and so are you. And I'm just so glad we're still friends and we've kept in touch through all the moves. And it's just so valuable to have you on this podcast. You're a great thinker. You're a great person. And for everyone listening, as promised. At the end of this podcast, I will put the full-length song of Aramonte as written by Frank or Herman, recorded by our band Punch Clock. And if you want to hear more of our band, there's actually a SoundCloud tab under music on my site, MikeyUp.com. I like it to this day. It was a good album. I totally agree. And uh, once again, a big thank you to Frank Ray Herb, and we will see you soon. I used to think there was an answer to find